The title of the talk is Agora Gardens and Projects in Manila. Um, and the questions that we ask are how do gardens function within the infrastructure of cities, behaving often as spaces of private contemplation for elite circles, as in Tang China or spaces of public assembly in German neoclassical architecture. Gardens and publics have often been central to the intellectual and political lives of cities across historical periods. Former Fulbright scholar and urban planner Julian Abriha will deliberate on questions of public space and modes of navigating the urban in conversation with Dr. Fernando Napila Jalcita, head of the Cultural Heritage Studies Program at Ateneo de Manila University. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you so much for coming, Julia. Uh, I, I'll just make a brief introduction to Julia. But Julia is an urban planner who is passionate about making cities livable, lovable places. After arriving from the U.S. in 2008, as a Fulbright research scholar, Nebria decided to make the Philippines her permanent place of residence. She has worked at all levels, from community organizations to international agencies to government, with the same goal of developing sustainable solutions to urban challenges. She draws inspiration from biking around the streets of Metro Manila and has worked on projects such as Viva Manila and Inclusive Mobility Network. Nebria has also been exploring the Pasig River and collaborating with creatives in grassroots movements in historic Manila. Nebria graduated with a bachelor's degree in international affairs and development from the George Washington University and later complete a master's degree in urban design from the City College of New York. Dr. Fernando Nampil Jalcita, or as a lot of us call him Dr. Butch, um, is a professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Loyola Schools at the Neo de Manila University and heads the Cultural Heritage Studies Program at the city. He earned his MA in Philosophy from the Ateneo de Manila University and an MA and PhD in Anthropology from the University of Hawaii. His field research has focused on farming communities in the Ilocos, Northern Luzon and street research in urban heritage and regeneration. He is active in groups advocating the pre preservation of built heritage, believing that cultural identity can be better understood when examined from various angles. He writes on the interface between the Southeast Asian and the Hispanic worlds and domains of Filipino culture, such as traditional architecture, cookery, and popular Christianity. So, for uh, we prepared just a few slides um, to shape a bit the the uh, the talk in, in relation to art history and, and um, in relation to the exhibition. Um, one thing that we ask amongst ourselves is what is the role of gardens in society and how does this manifest in the history of art? Um, just five examples is um, a famous one, Hieronymus Bosch's um, cryptic, often referred to as the Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, oftentimes the garden is used as a symbolic landscape for um, many things happening in society. It's often a portrait of um, society as well. Uh, and in this case, um, possibly what's wrong with society. There are many interpretations to this work, but um, uh, this is perhaps one of the most important um, uh, images of the garden in the history of art. Um, so some examples. I'll just go quickly. <laughs> um, then we have the Zen Garden. Um, the Zen Garden is, uh, interestingly enough, a, a place for contemplation and meditation, but also, um, at the same time, there are often portraits of a greater landscape outside of where these gardens are situated. So the rocks, as they may seem as sort of um, uh, individual uh, objects that are abstract in, in, in form, they're actually, um, uh, they, they relate to a mountain or perhaps a, a type of landscape outside. Um, and then the Emperor Babur orders the making of the Charbag in Kabul. Um, the Babur Nama manuscript in 1589 shows um, one of the earliest manifestations of the garden in where it becomes a place for community gathering and, um, and collaboration. And then of course George Suras, um, a Sunday afternoon at the uh, island of the Grand Jatte in 1884 where um, the garden is often a space used as um, a way to critique, uh, a venue for us to critique society. Um, 
uh, there's often times the spectator is a voyeur looking into um, basically what's wrong or what's happening in society. And um, I won't go further into that, but with that I'd like to um, give the floor to Dr. Butch Dal um, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, uh, good, good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jama Kusar for inviting me. Um, because actually I've been promising you that like, I wanted to dialogue with her now. <laughs> now we can have this dialogue, but in front of other people. <laughs> Um, I, I promise Jam I don't want to go beyond 20 minutes because it's also true to get still have an evening ahead of us. Um, I got interested got interested in this because of my interest in urban anthropology. I, I, I think a uh, big problem that we have in the city in our cities is that we don't appreciate the speed enough. So my talk will focus about the three con conflicting interpretations of the street. And now the, how this has seemed to, let, to have led to the mess that we found this week, as well as to their amplification. Uh, say amplification? Amplification. Not amplification, amplification. To become more and more um, nice. So I think we have to distinguish between public and private space. Uh, public space is central to the city. Um, you cannot have a city that's only made of private spaces. Private space is that concerns only particular households. Whereas public space is open to everybody. Next piece. So, semi -public, public space is a place of worship in the Philippines, belonging to an organized religion, but the place is open to visits by all, even by non members. Semi private space. Is space technically private, uh, but uh, technically public, but appropriated for private and for private groups. So public roads used for unregulated private parking or private vending or private dwellings would be semi-private space. Next piece. So what do we mean by a city? How how would define a city the way we would do it in sociology and anthropology? It's a settlement, the majority of whose residents pursue on a full-time basis occupations other than farming. So therefore, um, private spaces are needed, but you have you need public spaces so people can communicate across their specializations. Next please. So what I'd like to explore with you is so what interpretations of this street have been influential in Manila as well as our other cities? over the past hundred years. How can these differences explain the mess of our streets? And if you want a livable city, how reconcile these interpretations? So I'm using as a case, Calle Darbo in Quiapo, Manila. Um, actually, I, I wrote an entire book just on this street, uh, showing how it can be interpreted by different people involved in the area. So what I'm doing basically is just an excerpt. So this is Calle Darbo, the principal street, it connects actually two churches, the Church of San Sebastian and the Church of Tiapo. Um, this is how it looked like uh, in the 1830s. Still mostly uh, houses with uh, thatch roofs. Nice However, with the opening of the, the French Colgant and the Hanging Bridge, uh, many uh, middle class and upper class uh, families started to move here because of its proximity to Malacanang. So this is how it looked like. A street line with uh, arcades and big mansions. Um, a, an official guide for that year, 1860 or 70, describes this as the most beautiful street in the world. So this is Cali Dalton in the 1900s. Uh, there was a street car, as you can see. Uh, and then at the far end is San Sebastian. It's a very spectacular view. A typical Renaissance beast. Next piece. So this is Cali Lago. This is Cali Lago now. Um, the beast has been it's partially it's still there, but it has been obscured by the trees, and then it's, it has been messed up by the traffic. San Sebastian Basilica, which is now in the process of restoration. 
that's on the other hand, you have the other church. Next piece. Next piece. So much of this street now is, has been taken over by GPs as terminals. Next. So uh, I'm suggesting that actually there are three interpretations of this street that are vying for attention in our streets. One is uh, what they call the private balconies in a public theater, that concept, which, which is actually Hispanic or Latin in general. Latin. So, um, next piece. With the fall of the Roman Empire, um, urbanism declined in the West, so cities in Western Europe simply became warrants of uh, crooked, crisscrossing uh, streets. However, um, during the Renaissance, the great began to appear again. So, um, the idea of the city as planned along a great iron began to, began to surface again, and it was implemented precisely in the new cities of the Spanish Empire, in the Americas and in the Philippines. Um, however, uh, in Spain itself, eventually, um, the, the royal court realized that there was a, a tremendous advantage in having a well-planned city because this would uh, this facilitated the flow of commerce and uh, people. At the same time, it gave prestige to the, to the crown. Next piece. So, a classic example of this, of course, the Plaza Mayor, which I'm sure you have seen. Um, this is a classic example because the, the balconies front of the central plaza where in fact uh, sometimes good, good fights are held as, as well as other festivals. Next piece. Next. So this Plaza Mayor at night is transformed into space for cafes. Next piece. And um, I, I guess this is, this is for me the, the charm of vegan. Namely that the streets are used the streets are used um, as not only a uh, thoroughfare, but as a space where you can have public cafes in the evening. So um, the street balcony creates middle space between public, the street, and private, the dwelling. Next, please. OK, um, this is a campo house, Cali Dalgo. As you can see, there's an arcade underneath that allows the house actually to front directly on the street below. So the, the living room becomes a, a balcony on the street. So um, this is a view from the House of Estrellas in Teapo. Um, from, from the, from the uh, second floor, one can peer down directly into the street and see the spectacles occurring below. So this is the Nazarena procession view from this Fender house. It's interesting to note, according to uh, one of the Armetas, in fact, during the late 19th century, Calle Hidalgo was also used as a race course. Um, horses would run uh, from San Sebastian to the upper church, and people would bet. It's exactly what, what happens, for example, in Siena, northern Italian cities, where the the central plaza becomes a, a, a race course during the uh, fiesta. Next, please. Now, uh, another co another uh, concept of space that entered with the Americans is um, to consider the street primarily as a corridor with enclosed private spaces along it. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, Latin influence Southwest or Louisiana. Uh, in fact, I'm not even going to talk about New York. I think I'm, I'd like to focus on LA. Next, please. Hmm. The, um, in general, um, the British, British urbanism um, valued, speaking of gardens, they valued greenery. Um, but greenery which enclosed the house uh, away from the street. And churches in Britain uh, typically are in the middle of those. Uh, uh, squad of greenery. The Garden City is in fact a British innovation that became accepted worldwide. Next, please. So this ideal 
in the U.S., a house enclosed within the garden, no matter how small. Thus, a uh, private dwelling is, is distanciated from public space on the street. Next, please. So the suburb was invented as a controlled semi-private enclave in contrast to the public inner city. Next, please. Um, now, because of the emphasis on individualism and free enterprise, there was no attention paid to height and harmony of appearance among dwellings in the inner city. Um, next, please. So, the classic example of this, of course, is LA. Um, LA used to be connected together by a uh, streetcar system, but I think uh, Ford bought all the, uh, all the rails and the streetcars. The result is emphasis on private vehicle. And of course, the tremendous traffic for which LA is notorious. Next, please. Um, the impact of LA style urbanism is that uh, people began to migrate the suburbs from the 1950s onwards. So, in contrast to European cities where people prefer to live in the center, in the Philippines we prefer to live in the suburbs. And there's an emphasis on privately owned vehicles, whether cars or jeepneys and total disregard for visual harmony. Next, please. Next, please. So here you are, you have cars private uh, parked on arcades. But the arcades are supposed to be walkways for pedestrians. In fact, what is happening, what has happened to Kiapo is also happening in Binondo. It's also happening to Cebu, where arcades are destroyed to create space for, for private vehicles. Um, and the uh, GPs are not public utility vehicles, strictly speaking, uh, because they're privately owned. They're basically un uh, private entrepreneurs who pay rent to the owners of GPs. And so they're allowed by the city to have terminals on the street, even if they clog it. Next, please. So visual harmony has been disrupted, as you can see. No attention is paid to it anymore. Okay, a third. Set, uh, concept of space is what I would call transient private possession of public space. In other words, your space is yours to own for as long as you're on it. It's, but it's purely transient though. There is no title. Okay, next. Okay, so um, this brings us to the concept of space in indigenous settlements. By indigenous, I mean the native original culture before the coming of Chinese, Indian, Islamic, and Western influences. Next, please. Here, the boundary between private and public space is fuzzy. Parts of the street are appropriated by individuals for their own ends. Um, the use may be either temporary or with the passage of time semi permanent. Next, please. So, for example, vending in, in uh, Calidalgo. Some of the long established vendors set up stalls after World War II. And some of them have passed on that particular space in the street to their daughters and their daughters have passed it on to their daughters so three generations uh, using a particular space on a sidewalk but that is also, this also takes place in some part of it, along FEU next please so this is the result next please now what, what was it like in the barangay? Well. This is a construction of the long house of the dot based on the measurements given by the Jesuit priest Alcina in 1668. Next please. Uh, the basic unit, basic settlement political unit was the barangay. It numbered from 3,100 houses. Um, barangays clustered together from 4 to 12. But each datu was authority in Barangay. Um, mostly the datu was surrounded by members of his family and their dependents. Next, please. In general, uh, from what we know from the earliest accounts, this, the houses were sited irregularly along, um, along the coastline along, or along the river. Uh, and the basis was not permanent agriculture but slash and burn, shifting cultivation. So the barangay could move. Next, please. This is the earliest illustration we have 
of a barangay. So you have the longhouse and the dabi background, um, enclosed between two trees with uh, outposts. And then the rest of the barangay, the ordinary members, uh, have houses on a hill inside for protection. They're much smaller than the house of the dabi. Um, each barangay was actually private space okay? um, because the Datu was very strict about non Datu members, non, non uh, relatives, non barangay members visiting. So it's hard to speak of public space then. Um, okay. well, what has been my experience in the Locano hamlets where I stay? The rice fields are privately owned and titled, but anyone can open a public patch temporarily on the Sandy River banks. Which, uh, and somehow there's a continuity between that and Malina, where anybody bold enough can build on a sidewalk or extend his building on it or even use it as a store. So even Arvita, um, it's not easy to walk around uh, Arvita and I just, because even the, even the uh, sidewalks are used as bodega. So why the mess in our streets? Um, I think there has been inconsistent. First of all, there are those three concepts. Now, I think and, uh, we have actually implicitly prioritized the street as part of our affair. But we're not consistent about this. Um, and, and the other thing also is we, we just stay walking. Okay, next piece. On the one hand, we want the street as a corridor for private vehicles. So that's why we disdain a walkable arcades and the season setbacks. On the other hand, we have, the government allows vendors to take over both sidewalks and streets at all hours. So it's consistent. Okay. The street is supposed to be for cars and yet we allow si uh, sidewalk vendors to proliferate. So once one part of the street is clear, you can pass, but as soon as you uh, get them to the end, you cannot pass anymore because of sidewalk members. Next, please. Also, um, another problem is walking is disdained. Uh, it's disdained as uh, Pamanira. Hence, the poorest condition of our sidewalks and the field. Because uh, officials do not walk, they seem oblivious to the ugliness of our streets and therefore prefer to emphasize connection by cars. Um, this the prioritization over cars was brought up to me by a professor in one of the universities in the University of I should have mentioned the university. Because we're talking about regenerating the University of and just the opposite. Oh, we don't have to uh, set high prescriptions. We can just have high rises. And then touring can be done by just ferrying people from one high rise to the other. On very narrow streets. That, that, that is Dane for one. And I remember also a faculty member of ours in my department. Okay, well, temporary hire. He was always embarrassed about um, walking from our building to Katipuna because he says the students will look at him as poor because he's walking. So it's a problem. Next, please. So the question I raise is: Is the synthesis possible in the three urban traditions? So. That's a further answer, but let's leave it at that. We'll throw it to the audience, and then uh, we can have a discussion on that, but first I'll pass the floor over to Julia. Thank you. 20 minutes. Okay. I'll be short as well. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Thanks for braving the traffic, which I am no longer responsible for, <laughs> to uh, come to Pasatemo in the middle of the week at 7 p.m. Um, so I just have all my thoughts on public space because I haven't had, I haven't published any books and I haven't had the opportunity to investigate this in much rigor, but these are just kinds of my, my thoughts recently on, on how do we take the, the history of the public space that we've been given or not given and where in a highly built up urban environment can we insert it back into our urban fabric. So firstly, I, you know, why is, we know why Public space is important to a lot of cities in general, but why is it specifically important to our Philippine cities today? Uh, one of the things is about inclusivity. Like uh, Dr. Siasa uh, touched on, Dr. Bush, we are segregating space so heavily between the public and the private. 
and you can live your life in Metro Manila never seeing a whole sector of society, never seeing your friends if you don't want to, which is one of the nice things about a city. If you want to remain anonymous, you can. Um, but we are putting up walls and we are putting up barriers, whether physical or somehow a social barrier, um, to segregate people. Uh, if any of you were at the block party at Escolta this past weekend, I know some of you were, I won't point to you if you were there. But it's actually a lot more than just having a party in the street. It's about being able to have an open public space where people can come together. There are people from the neighborhood, there are people who came from Quezon City, from as far as Makati, you know. Um, <laughs> to, to be together in a space, you have to create those opportunities for interaction between social class, between geographic barrier, that's what, that's what public space is for. So those are creating opportunities to give people an excuse to be in a public space together. Um, what happens when the only public space is the atrium of a mall? It's great that we have the, you know, the, that mall space where people can have a graduation, a badminton tournament, uh, a movie screening, um, you know, some kind of performance. It's great to weave that in, but it is a commercial space that has a certain purpose and also is only accessed by people who feel comfortable to walk through that space. Right? So there's, there's a barrier. Um, resilience. If there is going to be an earthquake, well there's going to be an earthquake, hopefully we're not here for it. Um, but if, if and when that happens, where are you going to go? You're supposed to go outside to an open space. If we don't have open space, we don't have street space, where are we going to go outside in the case of an earthquake? Okay. Um, where are our open spaces to help on flood mitigation, on environmental protection, things that will give us that barrier that we need to be climate adaptive, to be resilient? Open space plays a role in that in our cities. Accessibility. Streets are our main form of public space in this city, in any city. And the way that we design our streets says whether or not we have space for public transportation, whether we can walk, whether we can bike. The way that 80% of our city moves is not in a private car, yet we allow the majority of the space to private car use, as was talked about earlier. So the street design plays a huge role in how we experience our city. And of course, the, the health aspect. I have like a bit of a uh, sinus problem right now. I don't know if you can hear it in my voice because I started biking again, finally. So um, I've been biking and it's just getting so much pollution. <laughs> like, even with my really awesome mask that I ordered online from the UK that's supposed to be 99.9%, you know, whatever, like I'm still... <laughs> that 0.1%. <you know, laughs> that 0.1% will just get you. Um, but even just walking around today when I'm not wearing my face mask, I wanted to get down somewhere earlier, run some errands, and I walked here, and I'm just getting the pollution to the face, you know? Uh, it, Good open space, places we can be that have greenery, where we can breathe, are important to our health. Um, we are, other countries, when they reach our pollution levels, close schools and don't let people go outside. And we do it every single day, all the time. So that's why I think um, even if we can't, it's not top of mind, although I see it being more in newspapers, I see it being more on Facebook, people asking where are our spaces to breathe in the city. Uh, it's not top of mind in a way, but I think it relates to a lot of other issues that are top of mind. Next. So we don't have an actual definition in the country for public space, but the UN habitat definition is public spaces are sites which are accessible and enjoyable by all without a profit motive and take on various spatial forms including parks, streets, sidewalks, markets, and playgrounds. Good public spaces enhance community cohesion and promote health, happiness, and well-being for all citizens. Next. Um, I've tried to see, you know, in comparison to, this is just green space, so that doesn't cover all of the, the street space and the other plazas and parks. I mean, we'll, it might, we'll cover parks, but um, the estimate that we have based on, a, I think it's a 2015 study, uh, is five square meters of green space per citizen in Metro Manila. Um, that might be plus or minus, uh, <laughs> we don't know. But the, the average that uh, the World Health Organization recommends is a minimum of nine square meters uh, per person. Um, as you can see, Vienna is at 120, but Tokyo is only at three. But the thing is that this is only amount per person. That doesn't mean that three meters per square person in Tokyo is more accessible to a wider population. Great, we have Echo Mesa Park, but how many of you have been there because you have to drive there on Commonwealth to get there, right? So 
you know, it's also about how you have access and how that is distributed. So there's another figure that WHO says that every urban citizen should live within a 15 minute walk to green open space. So it's not just the amount, but it's also the accessibility to how it's woven into our daily lives. Next. Um, so I talked about we have to revolutionize, you know, the opportunities for us now today, we are not going to demolish, as far as I know, big tracts of land and uh, a built up area to create a central park. So how are we, you know, some of the other cities outside of Metro Manila, some of the emerging cities will have that opportunity to plan now and plan well, and they might be able to get those bigger spaces. But especially in somewhere like Metro Manila, our big opportunity is to revolutionize street design. We can reclaim those spaces, um, get the parked cars off the street, get them off the sidewalk, and try to weave back those open spaces into the existing network that we have. Next. Another opportunity that's going to be coming up for us as a city is the fact that we have a lot of transportation projects um, in the pipeline. So we have the bus rapid transit, we have the subway, we have the MRT extensions, we have the existing MRT and LRT stations, and hopefully we also have um, Hopefully, we also have a ferry station that will, ferry system that will be coming. So, with all of the development of all of those stations, um, there is a chance to also increase the street networks to those stations and weave in public spaces like plazas and open space next to those stations as they get developed. Next, um, these are this is a map that was done by the um, the landscape architecture. Uh, class in um, UP under Professor Navarra, and they have tried to map those green spaces. And you can see the swatches where there's just not any. So again, it's not about the amount per person, but it's also about where is it and how can you how can you access it. Next, uh, the other big opportunity for us is the waterways. There there are there's a lot of encroachment, but the waterway is also a open space network that we have in the city. So even when you're going on the ferry and you can see the, the trees, you can see the open view, you get to breathe clean air, you see some birds, and it, it's, a, it's a, a space that we can reclaim as part of, the public, um, part of the public arena. It's not just a park in the sense of like a central park. That whole corridor of Pasig River is an amazing open space network that we haven't maximized yet. We actually have 680 kilometers of open waterway in Metro Manila. Some of that's going to be asteros that were paved over, but a lot of it is still existing. Some of it has encroachments, and we do have to figure out the housing situation, but that's something that we have to do anyways because they're in a danger zone. So these are new opportunities, 680 kilometers of open waterways in Metro Manila. Next. So some examples that I like, um, Calle Cruzolago was, uh, was mentioned in, uh, in Vigan. Um, some, uh, you know, that's a pedestrian street. It was only a matter of designating it as car free. And the retail in that area has improved. It is now a tourism destination, and people go there specifically because they know they're going to be able to walk around and browse on that street and see something different and not be bothered by the pollution and the chaos that cars cause. Um, a proposed project was this, um, I took this example, it's from the DOTR, the Capitolio, uh, East Capitolio Street, on how do you start to redesign existing street spaces. And then um, an international example would be something like the, the Robles in Barcelona, where you start to create corridors, and now they're doing the super blocks in Barcelona, where they close off um, the three by three blocks to create these whole new network of pedestrian areas where no cars are allowed in the residential areas, and they can only use the major streets on the outside. So again, very minimal investment in a way because all you're doing is reclaiming and redesignating use. It's not like you have to build a whole new system, you're not building a highway, you're not building a subway system. You're just saying this nine blocks are going to be for people. Next. Parks. Um, this upper example here is the is Tigig, uh, TLC Park. It's a small park in, um, in the city of Tagig across from Laguna Bay. Uh, the city decided to designate that public land as a park and they actually allocate money every year for programming, for landscape, um, and people can use it on, on the weekends um, during the week and it's a great spot. Uh, something that we could do is turn that golf course around in Tremoros into a park. Um, how many people use it as a golf course versus how many people would use it for a park. And you can even make more money with weaving in commercial establishments, booking fees for revenue. I, I think we can make more money off of it as a park than as a golf course. Um, 
as well as it being a major, that is actually a designated evacuation site for the city of Manila. Because where are you going to go when you have an emergency? Where else is there open space? It's Rizal Park and it's the golf course. Uh, an example that I like is the South Park in San Francisco because they were able to just again use like the middle of the street and redesignate that space into a park. So it doesn't have to be this big central park. Everyone's going to wait for a central park that's not coming. Um, let's just figure out where we can start to insert it back into the city. Uh, plazas. Plazas are a big part of our urban history. Um, it's one of the open spaces that we inherited during the Spanish period, and a lot of them still exist. Uh, in Angeles City Heritage Plaza, one way that they just improved it was to underground all the cables. So the view line is actually preserved. And then they did basic investments with the um, morocco poles that they took out of the area. They transformed them to benches and other street furniture. So that was kind of interesting. Um, an opportunity for, for a new type of plaza is this example from Carredo um, in the city of Manila connecting Santa Cruz Church to Escolta. So again, an urban design exercise of extending the sidewalk, creating a new plaza that gives an entrance to the church, connects it to the street of Escolta. These are interventions that are, you know, you're, you're just basically taking a little, you're just moving the curb, essentially. Um, an example, an international example of a plaza that I love are the water plazas in Rotterdam, which have now been adopted in the Netherlands, in China, in Brazil. It's essentially a, a public space that is sunken. So it can be a basketball court, it can be a soccer field, it can be a performance space, and when it rains, it fills up with water and then becomes a pond. And then eventually, and then the rainwater can be collected, it can be used for, for landscaping, and um, when I was, I saw the mayor of Copenhagen last month when I went to the Netherlands for a bicycle conference and I was asking him like, you know, we're, you're so known for biking. Like, has that been the legacy of your, he was in two terms, this is his last term. I said, what will be like, you know, the, the major issue of your, of your term that will define kind of your two terms as mayor of Copenhagen? And he said, you know, it wasn't actually biking, it was surface water treatment. It was putting in interventions like this to capture water and weave it into public space because they had a storm that destroyed public property or and private property in Copenhagen and they never want to have that happen again. So they're investing in like stormwater management and a stormwater capture like this, weaving it into public space. Next. And then lastly, it's waterfront. So we have examples like the Ilo Ilo Esplanade, uh, 1.2 kilometers of, of waterfront that was reclaimed. The land value in that area was between two to 3,000 pesos per, per square meter. And after they made this investment, which is about 170 million pesos, to, to build this esplanade, the land value went up to 15 to 20,000 pesos per square meter. That's a 600% increase. So not only is it good for the public, but if the government wants to make back money as well, the revenue on the land value is also a good return. Um, this is a project I have been proposing before with MMDA to reclaim and create greenways around the Libertad pumping station. And then this one up here is the Chicago River Walk, which I like as an example because a lot of people think that cities are already like, oh, Chicago's, you know, already has a great identity. Chicago's already like popular and doing well. But there's always room for improvement and so many cities, this was only built two years ago in Chicago. And I have relatives who live there and they're like, why was this never done before? It's an amazing public space that now so many people go and enjoy when they were already going downtown before. So New York as well, reclaiming their waterfronts when it had been highways for so long. Paris, you know, places that we think that are already done, that are already doing well. There's always a, another opportunity. It's a journey, you know? Uh, next. So that's kind of, <laughs> I don't know how big my face is that picture. Anyways, um, so I think uh, those are kind of the opportunities for public space that, I, that we can identify to weave that back into the city. But my big question and what I want to talk to Dr. Bush about after I finish this is, but what kind of public space are we going to build? Because he talked about, we went through the Spanish period and public space was a plaza. The plaza on the street is a form of control. All of, after basically the early Morabai and the Datu, every form of urbanism that we inherited was either the Spanish or the American, and it's about taming the savages. That's what, it was part of manifest destiny. It's part of giving us a, a sense of control. So where do we start to find what a Filipino sense 
of public space use would be. And what I've I've been able to see a lot of examples as I bike around Metro Manila. I don't think I would have learned that sitting in a car. I've learned it by being out walking and by biking. So these are some of the things that I've seen. Next. Um, the way that we announce a barangay. There's a certain visual language to a barangay. And one of them is the entrance. So you'll see that every barangay has its own type of way of announcing itself through like an arch of some way, you know? So where did that come from? And, and it's so interesting, like, even if they can't afford it, they'll have, you know, like the Fiesta leftovers, bottles, <laughs> paper cutouts. I see a lot of broken CDs. You know, if you're wondering what happened with the CDs that you threw away, they are now part of Broadway entrance somewhere <laughs> in Metro Manila. <laughs> Next. Uh, banderitas. Yes, a plastic waste or a plastic reuse, we don't know. But um, they announce the space and let people know that this is a street that's special for some reason. Next. Um, the Barangay Hall. Maybe we have to accept once and for all that a Barangay Hall is going to need to be somewhere. And maybe we have to weave that into the comprehensive land use plan or something because they're just sticking them where they can stick them. Right? Uh, usually on a sidewalk, that's a little kind of treehouse type of one. Um, this one has a basketball court and the, the, the land at the same time. So we maybe need that needs to be a key part of the, the urban language of a Philippine neighborhood is the Barangay Hall. Next. Um, processions and expressions. Uh, this is in Poblacion. The first three pictures are in Poblacion um, during the um, Visita Iglesia, the Seven Stations of the Cross, where they actually put in and close down the streets and put in these like theater setups in around Poblacion and people walk around and visit them. This one is a in Marikina along the river where on Sundays it turns into a, a worship a space of worship. Next. Uh, again the Belen, you see this everywhere. That also and there always is a light so it becomes this like beacon at night as well. Which is great. Maybe that's every single corner. You know, not every single corner, but you know in, in that announces some kind of distinct entrance or barrier, it's also a light source, it's also where people are walking to give to give offerings. You know, this is the kind of thing that other cities people would be like latching onto and saying what great sense of expression, what, what great sense of identity, you know? Yes. Uh, the basketball court, a major, major, major one. Um, the basketball court is I think one of the most brilliant sort of in other countries they would call this tactical urbanism. It's DIY, it's pop-up, you know, and they would give you a grant just to like do things like this, you know? And this is you can roll in that basketball court in the evening when there's no more cars using it, when it's not hot anymore, and your friends are all home from school, you just have to take the rocks off and like roll it into the street. Sometimes the court is already painted on the ground and the cars can go over it during the day and in the evening you just have to install it. Um, the basketball court also doesn't just serve as basketball. It's a place to have a funeral, to have a graduation, to have a beauty contest. It's some sense of a plaza. Next. Um, so these are various types. So of course, the basketball court, um, that we have other types of fiesta. We need places to, we need spaces, I feel, in Philippine society, you have to have pashal. You have to have an opportunity to have either some kind of performance or some kind of celebration or some kind of feast or you know something. Um, there has to be space to, to, to do that, have the performative aspect. Uh, practicing dance in Marikina, again in the river. Most parks that I go to, Rizal Park in the evening, students practicing dance, practicing music. Um, and then of course Zumba. Now Zumba is the best thing. I mean, <laughs> Zumba is just other cities are just trying, they're dying to find ways to get their people out and exercising. And yet we have any parking lot in the morning at 6 a.m. Whether you want to do it to techno, you want jazz, you want oldies, you want Latin, it's all there. There are different CD players waiting for you. Okay? And that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing. We actually broke the, we have the Guinness Book World of Records for the most number of people practicing, practicing Zumba at the same time in Mandaluyong in 2015 on the mayor's birthday. Like 12,975 people took 84 instructors. They prepared for two months, you know. Um, this, is, this is something that is special. We should recognize that as something that's meaningful for the city. Next. 
So the reason why I, I'm going through all of this is because I think we have to, we're at a critical point in our urbanism to take a look back and say, here's what happened during the Spanish period, here's what happened during the American period, and here's where we are today. And we don't know what all this chaos means. And because we don't know what all this chaos means or how to evaluate it, how to bring it into an urban language that makes sense in the sort of language that we've inherited about what a city should be, what ends up happening is we borrow typologies from other places and we say, in this disorder, let's just give it super order. And instead of going to our rivers, you can visit the fake canal of Venice. <laughs> and it's going to look like some interpretation of a European city in the middle of Metro Manila. And I'm not knocking the developer, I'm not knocking this, because this is the demand that we've created. You know, a lot of people I see on Facebook, they take their dates here and they love it. You know, and it's like, because where are you going to take your family for a gondola ride in Metro Manila if not here? You know, so we're raising a whole generation of people who don't have another example. And I, I read an article about a new children's park in Cebu, and the kid said that it was the first time he'd ever been to a park in his life. And he really liked going to that park instead of having to spend his, you know, hard-earned, uh, you know, money that he was saving up to go play video games in an internet cafe or go to the mall. And he liked the fact that he could go to a park. So we have to find a middle ground between this and also making everything bawa. You know what I mean? Because when you look at those other pictures that I showed, none of those uses are allowed on the street. Vendors are not allowed on sidewalks by law. Basketball courts are not allowed to be in the street. You cannot have a cockfight on the street. Maybe that's fine. Um, you can't, you know, there's a lot of like, there's just so many forms of natural expression that we're not allowed to do. So again, we are adding another form of control to the public space. And I think that, that that's where I'd like to kind of open the discussion up um, with Dr. Butch. And, and how do we start, where do we start to look at creating a language for a public space on how people today really want to use it. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe they can just ask Dr. Iron Butch to react and um, yeah. about because I think we both uh, showed a different perspectives on public space and how do we you know, what's your idea about where we start to form that new urban design language about, about public space for Philippine cities? Yeah, well actually, um, I, I threw this question on possible synthesis. Um, I think if you emphasize the virtue of walking, uh, emphasize that street should be walkable, I think, um, I think we might arrive at some sort of consensus. The problem is uh, people have stopped walking over the past 30 years. It's, uh, streets, but of course it's a vicious circle. They don't walk because the streets are ugly enough. But then I think we have to start somewhere. So I think walking tours are, are a way actually yeah. to, to awaken people to the wonders of exploring a city on foot. Even if the city is unkempt, dirty, etc. It's still interesting to explore a city on foot. And I think that might make uh, people more aware uh, that um, the street should be maintained well, that there should be space for pedestrians, that cars should be disciplined, they should be kept along certain corridors only. And I think uh, we should bring our politicians with us so that they can understand that you know this a street has a, a city has to have a certain uh, certain cohesion. Now, um, I'm excited about what Julia said, about, yes, we should allow certain things that are that are power. I think it's very interesting. Very interesting. That's a way of synthesizing. Yeah, in other words, there, there we go back to the third one. It's about uh, the fact that in the Philippines, we have this whole tradition of uh, cleaning as private space that is not used. But this is a very interesting mutation because, yeah, Okay, so you have in, in Makati, for example, the population. Uh, they are, they raise their Calvario during uh, Holy Week. There are about 50, 50 shrines that they raise. Okay, each is supported by a, a group. Mayor Bina is one of those. He's a member of one of those groups. They raise the shrines uh, for uh, four, four days starting, I think, starting with Holy Wednesday up to Easter Sunday. Uh, you have this Calvario in the different streets of the population area. 
they um, they sing the passion, but in fact anybody can just go without joining the passion and be entertained. They offer you food and drink, so you go from one um, place to the other and you can attend the procession. So that's transient use of public space. But after after Holy Week on Easter uh, Sunday, Easter night, the Calvary is taken away, and then the streets become uh, thoroughly public. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Hi, um, yeah. I like the idea of um, how public space or plazas are like forms of control historically. Um, and uh, I also kind of see it happening in current times on how if you do actually get to develop spaces, public spaces, green spaces, all these parks that are accessible or like uh, adequate or whatnot, and they are also forms of control as to what is power, what is not power. And um, this whole discussion on private space and public space, because if you say you open up a big park somewhere, um, some plot of land magically appears in the middle of the metro that's accessible. Ay, ayos, may park tayo dito. And then you see informal settlers settling in. And then the whole question of where do these people come from and where do... and how do we, city dwellers, process this phenomenon on informal settlers? And where do we want them or do we want them anywhere? Or why are they there and who are they within our city life? Because they are our working class pretty much. Um, so what, how do you sort of see yourself addressing um, issues on homelessness? And how do you see yourself addressing issues on the private privatization of, of certain infrastructure, privatization of things that are supposedly, uh, are supposedly public, for example, transportation. I mean, a lot of us here are like, fighting for Uber and whatnot, but then we're not exactly fighting for like the proper MRT system and how it's actually public-private partnership, which is pretty much bullshit. Because um, and then it's not working. Um, four times a day it stops. And then we're, we want to give this like very beautiful idea that, that we live in a city that it's possible to bike from Quezon City to Manila. But then it's really not. Um, how do we see ourselves talking about the uh, rampant development of uh, commercial and residential high-rises wherein um, it actually affects and contributes to the congestion of city of urban spaces. For example, I grew up in Basi and then there is Capital Commons and then, oh yeah, there's a park, but then all of a sudden there is this big building in what used to be just the sky and just, I can see it from where I grew up. And then in the next few years, that whole skyline will be nothing because it's all going to be buildings. Capital Commons, the MCI, it's everywhere. And then traffic is really bad. I don't know how it is like two decades ago, but then now I don't know. Because when I was in school, I used to live in Pasig, studying in QC. I used to commute every day, but now it seems impossible. So how do you see this discussion going to address these things? And also at the same time, back to uh, informal settlers, how do we see this discussion um, taking a step back and addressing issues of like uh, land reform because most of the urban poor are from the peasant sector. So how do we discuss these things? How do we go on to talking about the city without talking about everything else? So I just kind of want to, I mean that's a lot of things, I'm sorry. So uh, maybe just whatever. <laughs> I mean, I think that absolutely we have a, an urban planning crisis in the country. There's no planning. I mean, we have to, yeah, you have to, we need more planners, we need uh, more plans, and we also need, I mean, at, this, at the top of it is we need, we need policies that also, you know, we're talking about public space. We don't have, the only policy that we have is that 30% of a subdivision has to be open space, and that, that can include the streets. That doesn't even include whether or not you have to allow places for parks, for basketball court, for whatever types of things. It just this 30% can be open space, which means that if you have 30% of the area are streets, then you're covered. You can tick that box. 
Uh, the only other, I was writing it down earlier, the only other policy guideline is that they're supposed to be 500 square meters per 1,000 people, you know, minimum of 0.5 hectares per 1,000 people for recreation. So these aren't things that actually guide you to do urban design. They allow you to be able to meet certain requirements, but not necessarily get what you want. So I think there's a there's a national urban policy that we need, um, supported by the right types of plans. And I think to answer your question about the land use, there has to be something about a spatial framework. So it can be that there are certain types of densities that are supported near areas of transit that are um, planned out such that all of those moving parts work together. And we and then again, you project for how many people are going to need affordable housing, you're going to project for how many people are going to be absorbed by the city, so you can plan an urban form that will support everybody. Um, we haven't done that as a country yet. So I think that, you know, your question is quite huge, and I would, I would, I would park it in the fact that we need um, to really strengthen the, the urban planning as we are practicing it today. That's kind of the, the general. And I, sorry, the last thing I would say is that there is a role for the private sector. You know, if um, just because it's a public land, there's also many, uh, there are many examples of a public space being managed in partnership with a private entity that helps to generate revenues that are needed to maintain a space. Bryant Park in New York is a very good example of that, where it's a public land, but it's co-managed by a private sector that creates, that's able to bring it into its next levels, if that makes sense. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Uh, um, that's a very large question. It's, I don't know where to start. But I was just uh, thinking, uh, yes, it's important to have planning, except that uh, I've been involved in at least two planning efforts in Manila. The plans were, were presented, etc., but they were not implemented. Um, architect Nathan, uh, Nathan Yell von Einzidel says it, he did a master plan for the population in Makati, commissioned by Mayor B. Naija Jamar. But that's not been implemented today by, the, by these other B. So I, I, I don't know, I think, I think uh, one solution might be really to conscientize the people. In other words, uh, strengthen neighborhood associations so, so that people organize themselves not only for fiestas, but also to attend larger issues like this, housing, streets, etc. I think uh, you, um, uh, not enough people, we talk about by any hand all the time, but by any hand the Philippines tends to be temporary. I think there has to be constant mobilization of people, so they, they plan for their area. Yeah. I would add that a very, something that I've learned, I mean, as being in government, was that um, we wait a lot for certain agencies or for certain people to do things. And I think that our, our biggest, you know, again, going off of what citizens can do is we, have, we should be going after our counselors and we should be going after the local ordinances. Because you don't need, so whether or not the plan is developed, whether or not the policy is developed, it has to be implemented. And the main people to monitor that, yes, it's DILG, but it's us, you know. Um, if you want to take the parked cars off your street, you can go to your Bombay counselor and you can ask for an ordinance that says this street is not going to be allowed to have parking on it. If you want to plant trees and you want to say that there should be a day to plant trees, you can go there and ask them for that. Um, there's a lot of more activism that we can do at the local level. I mean, how, have you, how many of you even know who your counselors are? Do you know any of your counselors? Or participate. Have you ever been to a public consultation for comprehensive land use plan in your city? You know, so I'm not blaming you because I don't even know when they are. Like you'd have to really call over and over again and find out. But there's a big disconnect about sort of who's making decisions and the things that we're just accepting that come towards us. We can be a lot more proactive, and I think the local government ordinance, you know, that can be a block by block solution for the things that, that we want to do. Yeah. Right, hey, um, yeah. I noticed in the presentations most of the models for urban planning, street planning are mostly Western. Yeah. Um, I was wondering maybe we should open our open our minds more and look at other models of how people use their streets. Um, maybe, for example, if we look at Hong Kong or Taiwan, where they have night markets, mm -hmm. and basically it's a very messy situation, but 
but it serves the purpose. It provides people with a form of livelihood, yeah. and it allows them to make a living in the city. Yet there is a compromise. During the day, those streets are usable, but at night, it could be as messy as what we have during the day in, in downtown Manila. But yeah. in a way, everyone is accommodated, and and they're been, they've been allowed to evolve to a point that it may start off messy, but they improve the situation. So people actually go to these places. Mm -hmm. Tourists actually go there mm -hmm. to experience the city. And it yeah. is something positive, not a negative, messy, uh, yeah. uh, you know, like collection of vendors. Absolutely. I should have added something there. The, the guidelines that I like that I was using as an example for exactly that, they actually come out of India. And they're looking at coming with local street development guidelines, local urban development guidelines that incorporate vending space. They incorporate having frontage that extends for vendors from the house even into the sidewalk. The sidewalks are wider. There's play spaces, there's worship spaces that are into the government code, which I think is like when I was asking earlier, how do we start that? You know, why can't we reverse that from a big bubble and say these are the things that we need to do in our cities and how do we create a language for supporting it? Um, there's a really interesting study done by, it's called Sidewalk Lab or Public Lab from MIT called um, Sidewalk City, investigating mixed-use streets of Ho Chi Minh, where it's not even about looking at a street as the sidewalk, it's about the sidewalk by like one by one foot squares. And these three, these three squares from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. is like noodle vendor. And then by 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., like eight squares is like baskets. And then like from this time to this time, and it's, it's not even anymore looking at a street and a sidewalk as the corridor, it's looking at how do you appropriate blocks of an area over the entire span of 24 hours of a day and how do you create regulations and even give permits for like two by two for two hours and then like five by six for three hours. You know, the concept of a mixed use sidewalk is what Asia is. And I think that you're absolutely correct. We have to develop a totally new language, I think, for, for dealing with that and for, and for designing within that. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to that. It's my experience in Indonesia, and to a certain extent Malaysia. It, but Indonesia especially, I noticed that during the street, uh, in, for example, Jogjakarta, uh, during the daytime, the, this, this uh, sidewalks of the main streets are empty. However, after six, the street people start setting up their stalls, their cafes, uh, their vending shops. I, th I think we should do that, do that here because I think the street should be clear in the daytime to, ins to uh, emphasize the privacy of public space for everybody. But then at night, then uh, the spa uh, spaces in the street can be used for uh, shops and, and cafes. That, that would be a compromise. Yeah. Um, is there a way to kind of reframe the discussion around the fact that so much of Metro Manila is, so much of um, the land in Metro Manila is used by gated villages? Mm -hmm. Because like there have been some discussions on opening gated villages, because that's a lot of streets. That's a lot yeah. of space for cars. Yeah. But then we bring in discussions of um, private space and security. But of course, it doesn't kind of very politically correctly leaves out who's being that safe. So could maybe how could the discussion be framed around that, like transferring discussions of blight to these very managed, very heavily controlled, but also very surveilled areas. Um, we have within the policy rights of the Constitution to take back that space. So, it can be done. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I don't see that being one of the wins that we're going to be able to have anytime soon, to be totally honest. I just, I don't, I, don't, I don't see it. I think maybe under the traffic argument, there might be some. We might see it, for instance, like the Lesbianas, um, uh, friendship routes where you can get like uh, a pass to go with your bike through the different subdivisions. I, we've been in discussion about that. I, I have had discussions like that before with Quezon City. Um, I would, you know, there's there's certain things, but it's going to be very regulated. I mean, it's going to be very regulated. I don't I don't actually know, but I, I don't see that being what they love to call a low hanging fruit. <laughs> but I don't know what like yes. <laughs> May I comment on that? In fact, one of my nightmares is seeing the spread of gate and end place rather than um, What's wonderful about Philippine towns is that there's still a lot of space represented by the plaza where people can relate, whether rich or poor. But what's 
happening now is that weighted end phase are appearing. And that will tend to make the weighted end phase in the colonies that are sharply divided from the rest of the inner city. That is my fear. Um, that will also create the, another barrier between rich and poor. But it's happening now. I mean, many uh, municipalities consider themselves progressive once they start having gated enclaves. Um, now, but why are there gated enclaves? I think it's the problem is a vicious circle. Um, in our area, for example, I, I, I live, for example, in a gated uh, subdivision. Originally, when we moved there, uh, 50s, uh, there, were, there were actually no, no gates to the subdivision. The streets are open, except that because of the uh, uh, laxity of the local government, uh, there were informal settlements that began to spring up with the streets. So it made passage impossible and also it made it uh, in, uh, risky. So uh, as a result, the, the neighbors in our place decided to, to put up barricades to, to protect the uh, to protect um, our subdivision. And I think that's happening everywhere. It has to do also with the fact that local governments tend to be weak. In other words, uh, they count on votes. They, um, unfortunately, after, I noticed after World War II, there was this, uh, okay, so finally uh, officers became elected. And how, do, how did mayors expect to stay in office? They would rely on the votes of uh, incoming migrants. Without that, so the, they would allow poor people to, to, build up, to build their houses everywhere. At the same time, there was no program for social housing. So I think that so that I think that is one explanation. In other words, um, migrants flowed into the city. Uh, land was expensive, um, so they were allowed to build their houses anywhere else, on, the, uh, on condition, however, that they would vote for the uh, party in power. The same time, the party in power had no plans for uh, improving the city, no plans for social policy. So I, I think the problems. I would say one way to maybe go about it, though, is not to, it's, I think it's going to be one of those things we can't tackle head on and say, here's what we're going to do, now we're going to open this up and everything's going to be public. I think one of the ways for the younger generation is to get them out of those gated areas and invite them into other spaces to appreciate it. I mean, that's kind of what we've tried to do with some things, like in Intramuros, for instance, is like create a reason why people should come to the other walled city, <laughs> to the old walled city, but get people to like walk around, get people to, I'm going to be doing a tour of Poblacion with like Tita's of Rockwell, um, <laughs> just, you know, and you can't discriminate the opposite way also, right? Like you can't be like, oh, like my almonds, so I'm not going to, you know, engage or something, but you have to, I think it goes both ways and we need to, we need to find ways for people to understand why it's important. And I think the only way to do that, I can show data till I'm like, you know, on the floor. I can tell why it works in all the other cities in the world where everybody has visited and loves, but then says we can't do it here. We have to show examples of why it's important and people have to have to experience it for themselves. So I think that's why it's it's really important a lot of these citizen movements that are happening that create opportunities for people to actually experience the city and try to understand it. The only place I've been going to Tondo for for years, I take jeepneys, I take tricycles. The only time I've ever had a cell phone stolen was during Fête de la Musique at a paid venue in a venue with a security guard that was at the door. You know, so I mean, you know, knock on wood, not like, but you know, I think it creates more fear the more walls that we put up, and it cr and that creates more myth about the other side, and we have to create some way to bring that barrier down. But I don't think it's going to be something that we do head on. It's going to be like all the ways around it. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, um, yeah, I mean, reflecting on what uh, was shared earlier, is that um, somewhere in our history, uh, our history has made our society very fragmented. And that is actually manifested by all of these, uh, what I would say, ways of coping with our physical, uh, with our physical environment. In the same way that they're saying that squatters colonies are actually solutions, actually they're housing solutions of the poor. In the same way they're housing solutions for the poor, so are subdivisions 
um, housing solutions for people who cannot rely on government to provide them the infrastructure that they deserve. And I can understand, I mean, I've never lived, <laughs> although I work for a company that does gated subdivisions, I've never lived in a gated subdivision myself. And what I've seen is that the difference between the two is that um, a gated subdivision has infrastructure which is maintained. And you now understand why they don't want to open it up. Because they pay for that infrastructure. Yeah. And you can understand that. So that's why you're right. It's not something that we can uh, uh, collide with head on. Um, but I completely agree that people should be able to go out. And in fact, I just like to share. And Julia will laugh at this. Um, my boss, when you know my boss, he, he, worked, he walks to work every day. So now we have a requirement in the company that every one of us will have to be able to walk well. We just use 10,000 steps. We'll have to walk. It's, they will get a performance evaluation. <laughs> Because I lived in Malate, because I had a different life and I would go ride my bike and do other things, like now I know that that's possible. But at the same time, this last nine months when I was required to take a car and a driver around everywhere, my behavior changed so quickly the other direction. It happened so fast. And I was like, it was a good lesson for me because I'm always spouting out all these things. But I also realized how difficult it is to get out of your bubble when you've been doing that for so long. Your behavior change happens so quickly. It can also change back again. Like now I'm biking again. And you know, within two weeks of being in a car, I was like, how would I bike to Manila? That's so far. And then after doing it twice, I'm like, all right, yeah, I think that's once. fine, <laughs> you know? But it's it's easy to get stuck in what you're stuck in. And um, and I don't know, I grew, up in a, I grew up in a compound in Saudi Arabia. Um, so I grew up in like the gatedest of gated villages that you could, that you can grow up in. And I've seen it, you know, firsthand of, of what that separation creates you know, and it's and it's not it's not positive. <laughs> so we have to graduate out of it <laughs> at some point, I think. <laughs> Let me add two things about um, about streets before um, and um, about walking outside of the town. Okay, about streets. Before. I don't want to idealize, but uh, what I gather is that uh, Kalidaga, for example, where you have you had that that's like a Saragossa. It was actually a street where you all had rich, middle class, and poor families together. So um, from time to time during fiesta season, uh, houses were at, um, at open doors, and the neighbors were invited to partake of a communal feast. So I think, in, the, in a sense, uh, there was more mixing together. But I think uh, with the appearance of um, gated communities after World War II, 1960s onward, then uh, there was a tendency for the, the wealthy and the middle class to just mix together. In fact, there's even a tendency for the super wealthy to just mix together, even with, with the middle class. So, um, in a sense, class barriers have sharpened over the past 50 years. Um, but, um, architects Ramon Saragossa was telling me that, uh, okay, so he grew up in Calidado. What he misses in Quezon City is this, during the fiesta of the Naval, Quezon City. Yes, they celebrate within their family compound, but they cannot go from one house to the other, which was not the which is which is not the case in Tiapo, which is not the case in Tiapo still today, because you can actually go from one neighbor's house to the other, this open house. It's not possible, he said, in Quezon City. So he misses that sense of uh, community that you find in older parts of Manila. And uh, another thing about walkability, I'm glad Julia brought up the fact that. Uh, 
uh, and they make it a policy in their company to have people walk. I think we should make that a policy in our schools, yeah. starting with that in the process should propose it. Because it's a shame. I mean, you get super people from super wealthy families starting at the nail. And uh, there, there was this case of this girl, and it's not a, an unusual case. She and her classmates had to walk across campus to buy something at National Bookstore. But she was edgy because she was wondering what her mother would say. Her mother discovered that she had walked out of campus with her classmates. And there was another student who got scolded by, by his mother because he went to Cape Queen. I thought, what are you doing about it? It's not dangerous. And I think, you know, a lot of the things that I have done, I have, I have done them, and then people will ask me on Facebook, like, I want my daughter to bike to school. Like, do you think it's safe? And I'm kind of like, I mean, not really. <laughs> a false image about the things that you are like you know I'm and I think that there's a lot that we haven't discussed like we're talking about class but there's also gender there's also you know your age if you're a child or you're an old person and what's that what are we designing the city like for someone who's eight and for someone who's 80 you know how are we designing it for women or not designing it for women most of the time um, if I were if you know when I hopefully become a mother um, you know will I would I go back to living in Malate and trying to walk around the streets of Malate with a stroller? I mean, versus Rockwell? Like, let's be honest, you know, it's not that easy. So I think, I, I do, sometimes I get criticized for romanticizing the situation. I say, you know, it's just, it's just me and my perspective and how I live my life. But that will also change as we move along. And the city should be able to, should be able to accommodate, you know, anybody from 8 till 80, any gender, any class, um, and, a, and a great street will touch all those points, which is why there is so much emphasis right now in the urban development, in the urban design um, world of, of, about focusing on that on that public space as the thing that will weave us all together and be able to accommodate a lot of different people. But but I think we're really far from that here. And so I just want to, I mean, maybe just one thing to wrap up. I would actually like to ask the audience, you know, who do you know? Because um, this, is, this is a conversation. This is an ongoing conversation. Like, what are other great examples of you, that you see of people doing something that are good examples of either championing for public space, artists who are exploring those issues, writers? Who are the people that you are kind of influenced by or looking towards that are, or even you yourself, the ideas that you have, whatever you're working on, that are kind of part of this conversation? I'm, I'm curious to also learn from, from people in the audience if anyone wants to share something. Yeah, yes. Right. Um, I'm currently a student at CSP, and a few years ago we launched, we launched this project called Meta Movie. It's a platform about supporting street vendors within the past the South Asian area. Because uh, what we noticed is a lot of vendors, a lot of people usually buy uh, food from the vendors there, but the vendors there, uh, they uh, add to the traffic and the congestion around the area. So what we uh, did was we made it into a kind of like food panda, Uber-ish type, wherein um, students and other faculty and other members of the area can get order cheap food from the vendors um, anytime they want. And then um, we tried to launch uh, some sort of like night market for them as well, like designating areas where they could uh, sell or whatever uh, in certain parts of the street where it's not occupied at a certain time. But um, I'm not sure now as to what happened to the project because it kind of ended when um, other people wanted to uh, move out of the project. But it was mainly focused on this thing that they call the school design thinking, where what architects are like. Um, MMA students and other industrial design students collaborated with people from the community to you know, actually know what they wanted or what the community wanted. So uh, it's just an example of what we tried to do, but I'm not sure if it, like, if it had potential to, or if it could materialize in the future. Great. I think this is
it's a great example. <laughs> she had the round of applause. <laughs> um, when I asked the question earlier about how we, like, where do we start with trying to find a new language, I think you know, design thinking is a good example in terms of it should start with a conversation that incorporates a lot of voices. It should be a collaboration. A city is the most collaborative manifestation that we have as a society, you know, as being human beings. Um, so it's always going to be about trying to come with that vision together. I think design thinking is a great example of how to get that started. Sorry, you mentioned a while ago about Bryant Park in New York, right? Yeah. It's a public land that's managed privately. Yeah. Um, is it more of a, is it, because I think uh, in more recent news, you have the Terrace Park is also yeah. in the same situation. And so I was wondering, was there actually an economically viable way maybe even on a smaller scale, because you, know, you also mentioned how there are a lot of, um, that you're, we're not going to have a settled park type of thing, for sure, and one of the guys who had ago mentioned that um, big tracts of land, the government ends up selling it anyway, yeah. so, but then there are pockets of uh, places within the cities that exist that can be converted into open spaces, not just in the uh, basketball court type of way, but then um, let's say like maybe along the the Pasig by by Makati, where you see little bits of parks that are that are being that have been renovated to include open spaces already, but that's still managed by the government. So on a private uh, point of view, would it be possible where there could be an economically viable way that they can actually make small steps, I guess, but then to convert. Um, existing open spaces into something that they can make a movement to start uh, creating these, whether it's a park similar to, I don't know how Bryant uh, manages to yeah. stay fine. I mean, Bryant Park could have been built up into high rises. The land is valuable enough in the middle of New York City to have built on it. But, you know, what happened was that the land values, because there's that open space which is coveted, not everyone can live near Central Park, and Central Park is a, a place that people want to be. Not everyone can live near Bryant Park. It's a place people want to be, so the land values go up. So you still make a ton of money off of having this open space. You know, I think that's one of the things that we have to we have to look at. Um, and then secondly, the definitely. I mean, every time you hold a concert in a park, you look where Lollapalooza is held. It's held in Millennium Park in Chicago. They make a ton of money back on the park from having renting that space. Um, commercial establishments that pay high rent to be able to sell you ice cream as you walk through that park, $10 ice cream, you know, like, so, so there's definitely um, open space, like the example from Elo Elo, I mean, I think, uh, it's, 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 if we can, you know, Araceros is, it's under the city of Manila, and it's the CSR project of the Winter Foundation, so it's more of like a CSR type of, adopt a park type of thing, um, they haven't actually been given the chance to like make money off of the park, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. But um, I don't think we really have too many like public lands privately managed in the Philippines examples. It's mostly if they're privately managed, they're privately owned. But I think there's a way. Um, but I'm not sure here what the laws are about the the revenue that would be because the revenue in Bryant Park goes back into a foundation that then supports. For instance, summer art programs that you're just paying out money for, but it's free to the public. Um, so it's going into a foundation that invests in the public life of the space as opposed to like pocketing it. But the city would make more money, I think, on the land value than on the and on the leasing, but not on the profits of the of the thing itself. But there's a different benefit that they're after. Julia, is there a way to inform the city about the benefits of leasing parks for events, etc., so that uh, the city will realize that an empty space is not a dead space. It, um, the, uh, the city can benefit from it. That's my question. And the other question is, isn't it also the problem is corruption? Because um, estados are disappearing because they're being sold by government officials, private individuals, estados public land are being sold. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, a, a good example of how a park disappeared is Harrison Park. It was supposed to be a park. But why, why was it uh, leased or sold to the Martel and became Harrison Plaza? That, that's another problem, corruption. I, I guess because the public is not aware of it. They think it's normal. 
for what was once a green space be transformed into private space. Yeah, I mean, I think that also the, the more that we are, I think that, you know, there's, the, the more that you're distanced from the being involved in the conversation, the easier it is to get away with stuff. So, like, we, yeah, we weren't at the community, at the council meeting where they decided to turn over this, like, to change the zonal value, the zonal, um, you know, of the land from a public land to a private or something like that. You know, like, we weren't, we weren't in the room. We should be in the room. We should figure out ways to, to, to be, to be in the room. But, um, for, the the public spaces, one of the areas, it's not just the stairs, but all waterfront land. That's one of the things I really don't understand because the water code should say that a certain easement is within the national government land, but then there is the land use that is dictated by the local government itself. So I think that there are a lot of policy gaps when it comes to urban development. We're still treating cities like a series of like borough instead of saying this is a metropolitan area and there are things that are multi-jurisdictional that need to be maybe land banked, like no one wants to say that word, um, or they need to be given a certain jurisdiction or a policy that relates to national land in certain areas. And the streets, and then for instance, the, the street space in subdivision should fall underneath that as an example. So I don't see the policy, there's a big policy gap that could address that issue. Because even on the Pasig River, if you notice, like if the water code will tell you there's a certain amount of space that has to be an easement that no one has followed, really. But even if they did, there's nothing that says that it has to be continuous. So, so what that you put a setback, but if it doesn't allow me to go down the 27 kilometers of the river by bike or by walking, then like what's kind of, I mean, there's still a nice point if you can see the river, but it should be that, you know, it's multi-jurisdictional. It's not about the individual plot of land. And we don't have a lot of guidance and policy guidance that facilitates that, I think. But what do you think? You? <laughs> Julia, you're so right. There's no sliding at this. Yes. We could tend, tend to think in terms of plural. Um, yeah. One of the things I enjoyed uh, when I was doing field work in the middle office was that each plural was so intimate, so self-contained. The problem, though, is we carry it with us into the city. So the city is not really treated as one organic whole. We tend to think of this little in place. Sometimes they're gated, sometimes they're little streets that have, um, that have entrances, but we're not able to think of uh, the city as an entire connect interconnected whole without public and green spaces to, to give unity. That's a problem. Uh, I don't know how to address it. Probably it has to be addressed in the curriculum. It has to be addressed through citizen action. But that, that, I think, is a crisis in Manila. Yeah. The lack of concept of public space. So, what are your thoughts on the future of Metro Manila after Clark Green City comes up? Because they're trying to position it as an alternative. Like, the, I think the Department of Transportation moved there. And supposedly, there's a plan to move all the departments of government, all the branches of government there, all the agencies. And then, other urban planners are kind of excited about it because it's the first time um, there's been a greenfield kind of city of this size. I think it's 30 times the size of UGC. So they're trying to kind of get it right from the start and have bike lanes and walkways and uh, kind of plan the entire area, make it resilient because it's an alternative to Metro Manila but it's not on the fault line. Right? So yeah. some people think that uh, Metro Manila will go the way of old Manila I'm not worried about it because no one's going to move there. I mean, it's a great project to do because we should be preparing cities for future generations that aren't just Metro Manila. We should be investing in the secondary cities. You know, so Metro Manila is 10 times larger than Cebu or something, right? It's like 1.2 million in Cebu or something. So it's, we have to invest in the secondary cities. We have to make those viable options that the only, you know, place to make it is to come to Metro Manila. You have to be able to create the secondary cities. Clark, um, new Clark City, I believe it's now renamed, will be something for that for the future. It will be the Metro Manila of future generations and we should invest in that. And it's great that the master plan is gonna be such that we don't repeat the mistakes that we made in Metro Manila. But what I see Clark doing is helping to strengthen the regional connectivity of, of people and the economy across the region of Luzon and beyond. I don't think it has any, I mean, it's not going to do anything to, to uh, address what's 
and I don't see it having a negative impact on Manila. If people go, that will be one thing. But what I ask people when they say, like, everyone's going to be suddenly moving to Clark, I'm like, which one of your cousins is going to go first? Like, which one of your brothers is going to leave? I mean, we are entrenched, you know, um, here in Manila with our relationships, with our relationships to places, to other people, to our businesses, to our work. It will take some time, and eventually people might migrate, but it's not going to be this, like, grand exodus, which is fine. It doesn't need to be. You know, Manila is this thing, and that will be its thing in the future, and they'll all be part of a major beltway of economic development for the whole of Luzon. And, and especially when the rail comes, when all, the, when all that connectivity comes, maybe we'll be going to have dinner with friends in Clark. You know? But I don't know, I don't really see there being a grand exodus. There might be a stoppage of inflow to Metro Manila because it could be absorbed instead to Clark. But that's also fine because we're at capacity. So, <laughs> you know? Oh, excuse me, what did I say about the idea that we can build an ideal city and then uh, that would be the solution to the problems of Metro Manila? Well, before the war, Kesson City was supposed to be the ideal city with a lot of green spaces, with a lot of broad boulevards. What happened, you know? I mean, what happened to the green spaces in Kesson City? They disappeared. Uh, they've been disappearing because of the, the fact that city officials do not think in terms of the common good. They have allowed uh, green spaces to be swallowed up by private developers. So I'm skeptical about these plans for Clark. I think we have to change mindsets. It, uh, we, we carry a certain mindset that's really dangerous to cities because we keep thinking in terms of the little for all. We carry it with us all the time. Um, now, I'm, I'm also wondering about the uh, safety of Clark. In fact, last night I had dinner with an archaeologist who's doing a study of uh, 4,000 years of ecosystem in Pampanga. He, he says that archaeolo uh, geologists have determined that there have been six eruptions of Pinatubo over the past 4,000 years. So. And Clark is located right close, so I don't know whether it, it's such a good idea to transfer all the government offices there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we end, if someone can just tell me their favorite public space in Metro Manila. That is Anyone? a good question. Just curious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, uh, I like to say, when you touch my uh, at some point, before uh, uh, it's also used as my, uh, by my mentor as a case study for the my design class back in college. Uh, he mentioned that high speed eventually diminished the class at some point. Because uh, as you can see, uh, based on the layout, the gig area, uh, the coverage side, uh, uh, the, and then the Serenda high end, and then there's, there's high street, and then there's BG streets. So uh, it's, very, it's a very linear representation of how, uh, how class eventually uh, converged into one public space. That is a very effective and uh, that is not really intimidating. Uh, and actually, I observed it first time in the first few years of high school, uh, where back then they allowed people to actually uh, loiter around even uh, on the grass area. But right now, it's not, not, not much of a, uh, an amenity as an open space. But I think I'd like to commend the space as actually one of the most effective public spaces that we, we've had in the recent uh, years, in the past few years. Because uh, I think one of the greatest uh, really indicators of a public space functioning really well is that it equalizes class uh, or, or diminishes the class system that we have. Especially for a culture that really looks down on those who can't really, uh, or what uh, Dr. Bush said, uh, walking is this thing in our culture. So I think uh, really, uh, I think really managed, uh, or was able to show that kind of uh, what we really aspire as a, as, a, as a culture as manifest in a effective uh, public space. That's an interesting choice. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> I think, you know, but I think that's, you know, when you're asking about private or like, the, I think 
the retail around High Street has shown that, that that retail is actually doing better than the retail that's inside kind of the mall box. You know, I think Greenbelt shows the same thing that there is a way to integrate the open space with the private that still facilitates kind of your, what do you call it, your KPIs, or the, I don't know why I looked at you, you know what I mean? <laughs> you just have to look most official with the girl in the front, right? I was like, your KPIs, sorry, it's not directed at you. <laughs> um, but in terms of meeting those like financial goals, I think High Street's a great example of being able to give something. It is privately owned, and there are certain things you can't do, but in terms of like the benefit that it gives, you can meet your bottom line but still do extra. I think High Street's a good example. And I just remembered Washington CC Park, I think would be the closest example because it is managed by Masaya and it's protected under Masaya and then Masaya, right? It's under Makati Commercial Estate Association. Yeah, Makati Commercial Associate Estate Association. And they are also the ones who contribute funds to maintain that space. So I think that would be the closest that I could think of. Yes, another comment. Sorry for about the ad, but may also add that uh, we are very uh, mall. Uh, mall culture is a very uh, part of our culture, the malls. And I think uh, High Street is essentially a mall. And I think that uh, one of the, my few observances in the past few years is that we can really do away with malls. And I think we have to yeah, uh, incorporate the mall as a technology into the parts. Because now malls are slowly transitioning from just the box, uh, the box uh, configuration to a to a uh, public space that is uh, essentially open to the public. So I think uh, it's a it's a good starting point to to build on that kind of uh, typology, wherein you're opening the the conventional box mall uh, within the box mall configuration and incorporating it with the public space. So. Well, technically it's public, but I, I studied in UP Diliman. I still think it's the best, honestly. Um, a lot of people back then um, there wasn't uh, there wasn't still like the the akad pova, like people weren't allowed to jog yet. But ever since that they allowed a jogging lane and a biking lane for people there, um, a lot of outsiders have been coming in. A lot of families. I mean, basically uh, what what you said that. It, uh, it allows other classes, gender, it looks at age as well. You can see uh, the full people there, the young people, people with their dogs, maybe not in Akadova because it's not allowed. That's one thing that bothers me right now. Um, but in the other, you know, Yupidilaman is super huge. So in the other, uh, in the other rooms, people bring their dogs there. Um, and, this, and what you mentioned, like there are a lot of um, events. So you can utilize the space for a lot of concerts, a lot of like exhibitions. There have been a lot of uh, places there where there are sculptures, installations, and so it's it's still secure. It's still seen as secure. So that's a lot of issue. That's an issue for a lot of people. And it's really green. You don't have to buy anything necessarily. So yeah. like if you want to do away with the mall culture, definitely there's not a the mall culture there. Like. You can, it's a place where you can go and it's like, you're, it's free. You don't need to buy anything to play sports. You can sit around with your friends. So, that's a great, that's a great example. You know another one, um, the universities, also um, cemeteries. Yes. Um, <laughs> is another public space where you'll see people jogging. Um, you know, I mean, they're not going to mind. They're already gone, right? Like, <laughs> so you can jog around and everything. Uh, I think cemeteries is an interesting space that's also can be considered that that is actually marked in a lot of uh, comprehensive land use plans as public. So that's another another space. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. I was about to mention that this book is uh, probably one of the better open spaces the uh, American War Memorial. I mean, it's, it's very serene, it's well kept, but it's manicured. They think it just remodeled also the surrounding areas. And they do have some sense of uh, security there so, so that people don't end up also abusing. Yeah. So it, it also just, it is a memorial, but then in the end, the way it's done, it, I see it more as a park rather than a cemetery. Yeah. We live in prison. <laughs> Bikers will know that popular place to go biking on the weekend and they have something similar to a water plaza which is the man-made lake that's also a retention pond with the Mother Mary inside. I should end that.
I should uh, put that my next slide. Shall we wrap up? Okay. Well, um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. And